Berman with ARC. And I'd like to welcome you all to our performance measurement learning collaborative meeting. Um, it's going to be action packed, I hope. Uh, lots of good information about tools that people are using in the field. Uh, before we get started, though, I'm hoping that everyone can go to the chat and I'd like you to put in your name and just tell us yes, no, or not yet. Have you, since the last time we met, shared information about evaluation or performance measurement with any of your Lifespan Respite colleagues? So we just wanna know, have you shared yes, no, not yet? Uh, so if you go ahead and just put that information in your chat, I'd appreciate it. So your name and and I just did it. Oh, yay, I see some yeses. Sandra, what was the question? I'm sorry, I jumped on a little bit late. Oh, that's since the last time we met as a performance measurement group, have you shared information on performance measurement or evaluation? And that could be giving or receiving or just discussing it with a lifespan respite colleague. And the answers are yes, no, or not yet. Actually, the no's and the not yet's, <laughs> I'll, I'll group those together. Okay. Thank you so much for, for these answers. And uh, I'm so glad to have you here. Um, before we get started, I just wondered if Jill has any uh, welcoming comments. Um, where, is, where is our Jill? There she is. <laughs> Yes, welcome everybody. Uh, we're very excited that you all were able to join us. So close to the holidays. I always think holding meetings in December is uh, a little bit precarious, but thank you all very much for being here. And it, we have a really great uh, set of presentations for you today. And uh, thank you again. I'll turn it back over to Cassandra. Thanks. Um, in keeping with our wanting to keep these informal, uh, there, there may be some uh, going back and forth as we set up our screens to share, uh, but the first group uh, that's going to be sharing uh, is from Idaho, and they their Lifespan Respite Program. Uh, Lynn, I believe you're going to introduce, or was it Marilyn, the, the team from? Lynn, Lynn. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and let you get started and share what you have for us. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity this morning, Cassandra. I'd like to introduce our, our research team with Boise State and the Idaho Caregiver Alliance. First, we have Marilyn Sword. Um, I'd also like to introduce Dr. Sarah Taves, the professor from Boise State University College of Health Sciences and the director of the Center for the Study on Aging and the founder of the Idaho Caregiver Alliance along with Marilyn Sword. Tammy Sorrell, the Assistant Director, the Center for the Study of Aging, will be discussing our Lifespan Respite Research Project, along with Hannah Shifley, Shifley of the Idaho <laughs> Caregiver Alliance. She's the Director of Community Partnerships. Thank you. That's all. That's all we Thanks, have. Thanks, Lynn. Well, I'll let Idaho take it away then, because I know you have some slides you'd like to share with us. Thanks. Okay, so my hope is that you're seeing our slides. Correct. Yep. All right. Um, so Lynn did a great job of introducing our team. So um, Tammy, Sarah, and I are just gonna give you kind of a rundown of this program, the evaluation that we did, um, and just kind of highlight some of the awesome features of this. Um, so the program that we're talking to you about is the um, Consumer Directed Respite Program. Um, here we go. So the, the primary objective of the Consumer Directed Respite Program um, are to implement consumer directed respite statewide and across the lifespan for caregivers who don't have access to respite through other means. Um, and also to expand access to information about the value of respite and respite care resources. 
And then um, just a little bit about the program itself. Through this program, primary caregivers of any age, so this is a lifespan program, can receive a voucher of $600 that can then be used towards respite services over a six month period of time. Um, so primary caregivers are able to hire and pay someone that they've selected from their own support network. So a family member, a friend, a neighbor um, to provide respite care. Respite provided in this manner allows the flexibility um, so that caregivers can use the respite when it's needed. It helps to overcome some difficulties that come with the current workforce shortage we're experiencing. And it also allows caregivers to hire someone who's familiar with the individual that needs care, um, which is super helpful when you bring in somebody who already kind of understands what's going on. And then throughout the process, the primary caregivers are responsible for time management and budgeting. So that was just kind of a quick rundown of the program as a whole. And I'm gonna give it to Tammy to talk about the evaluation activities that were completed for this program. Thanks, Hannah. So let's dive into the evaluation piece of this. Uh, so the Center for the Study of Aging was hired as the evaluator for this grant. And the center developed a retrospective pre-post survey that is specific to this program. The survey was administered at the end of the six month participation period. And what this survey, uh, what, what the survey did was it asked the caregiver questions from a before and after perspective, before participating in the program and after participating in the program. These questions looked at skills, knowledge, and confidence levels relating to caregiving. Uh, responses used a five point scale ranging from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And on the next slide, we'll show you the beautiful survey. So what you'll notice is the survey questions or the questions are centered in the middle. The left side is the pre setup for the questions and then the corresponding levels of agreement. On the right is the post setup and the levels of agreement. So these questions would be read, before I participated in the Lifespan Respite Program, I was able to find ways to pay for respite services. And then the next question would be, now after I've participated in the Idaho Lifespan Respite Program, I am able to find ways to pay for services. So these questions looked at uh, ways to pay for respite services, uh, how, to how to find a provider, uh, the confidence in the quality of care that's provided, coping with stress relating to caregiving, taking care of personal health, as well as taking time for respite without feeling guilty, managing burnout associated with caregiving, and the confidence level to continue to care for a loved one at home. On the next slide, we'll talk about the, the results. So over 100 caregivers participated in the survey between March of 2021 and August of 2022. And from the statewide perspective, all caregivers reported an increase in the skills, uh, confidence and knowledge uh, from that retrospective pre-post assessment. So then we also looked at, um, so remember this program is lifespan. So we wanted to know how many caregivers participated in the program were 54 years of age or younger. So we took, uh, we, we just looked at enrollment data over a 10 and a half month time frame, And what we learned is that 27% of the program participants are ages 54 and younger. And yeah, this is notable, something to keep in mind for future programming as the age of the caregiver, uh, certain uh, respite programs uh, are dependent upon the age of the caregiver or the condition of the care recipient. So keeping in mind that lifespan uh, we have caregivers that are 54 years of age and younger, certainly a population to look at. And on the next slide, in case you're a nerd like me, 
and want to know more re the research behind the retrospective pre-post test, um, here's, some, uh, here's some articles that uh, you could look at. Okay. Hannah, you're doing great. <laughs> Thank you for advancing the slides. So um, over the years, I've been fortunate enough to kind of work on both sides of ACL grants, uh, having been a recipient of a grant as well as an evaluator. So I've learned a few things that I kind of wanted to share with you today. So there are different considerations or needs you might want to think about as uh, you, you evaluate your program. So first of all, from the evaluator's perspective, I'm always curious what data is already available. So for example, looking at the enrollment data from the consumer directed respite program, I was able to determine to learn how many caregivers were 54 years of age or younger. I didn't need a new assessment. I could just look at the data that already existed in a new way. Um, also consider how a program data is currently stored and retrieved. So as you think about if, there, um, if the program uses a specific software, data retrieval may require that software company to build custom reports to retrieve that data. So this might be something to keep in mind uh, when uh, budgeting for the program. And some data, com some data software companies, uh, it's possible to ask for the raw data. Uh, just another thing that the evaluator uh, may be able to access. Also thinking about what are the expectations for documentation? So this might include uh, level setting who makes decisions regarding the data for each of the involved organizations. Who's that primary point of contact? Who's gonna say, yes, this data can be shared with others? Um, who will de-identify data? This is a big one. This could be a huge time sink if you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of lines of data. Um, who will be responsible for making sure that personal identifying information uh, is removed? Who is responsible for the data quality standards? So thinking about if data is new data is being put into a software program, um, who's going to make sure that it's entered the same way? So I the, the example that I use are uh, street names. So do you type ST for street? Do you type out the word street? Do you type out ST period? So all those little details, uh, who, who will be responsible for making those decisions and communicating that to others? And also who's responsible for training staff if a new software system or data entry is uh, required for this program. And lastly, always ask the evaluator if there's an opportunity um, to share with staff the evaluation process. So is there a training opportunity for the evaluator to talk about uh, the metrics being used to track change or how the data is being analyzed? Uh, this could be a really fun opportunity for uh, the, the program and the evaluators to work together. And that is actually all I have on data. And Sarah is going to talk about the SWOT analysis. Thanks, Tammy. And, and thanks, Hannah, for managing the slides. I'll let you go to the next slide, Hannah. So I'm quite sure most of you are very are familiar with the SWOT analysis. It's looking at internal strengths and weaknesses and external uh, opportunities and threats. And the strategy for our consumer-directed respite we used, the SWAT for, was looking at a formative assessment activity. So we were concerned at the outset, as well as the area agencies on aging, concerned about how will this consumer-directed respite program designed across the lifespan fit with the existing organizations within the region that may also be delivering respite. You know, will this be seen as competition? 
will younger caregivers even think to think about the AAAs as uh, a, a resource for, for respite? So we use this SWOT analysis to see if we could identify challenges and how we could capitalize on opportunities that may be there. Our audience for the SWOT were members of the community, from the community. Uh, many of them were partners that the area agencies had existing um, that could be seen as, see this consumer-directed model as a potential threat to their organizations. So we tried not to just have all the friends in the room, but we tried to have a diverse set of individuals representing the lifespan and representing for-profit uh, and other service agencies that were currently delivering respite. And I'll let you go to the next slide, um, Hannah. So again, the basic SWOT strategy is we ask them to identify strengths of a AAA to deliver lifespan respite services, um, weaknesses in delivering lifespan respite services through the Area Agency on Aging, and then ask them to reflect again on those external opportunities and threats based on your knowledge of the community organizations and supports. Um, how might this delivery and marketing and communication be uh, maximized for uh, this consumer directed respite program? And then also finally looking at those threats. So from this work, and Hannah, I'll let you go to the next slide. What we did was we took the findings from these SWOT analyses, and this was all done during the pandemic. And so this was via Zoom. Um, and uh, we took the results and we provided each of the area agencies on aging aid and infographic as to what our findings were, trying to make it really simple, easy for them to see what they could capitalize on and um, things they should be mindful of as they roll out this consumer directed um, respite program. So for example, um, one of the weaknesses um, that were identified was the difficulty in marketing to people that may not label themselves as a caregiver. Um, and also thinking about that younger population um, and that the AAAs, that's not where their strengths lie necessarily in terms of their marketing and communication efforts. So to, we provided this information to them up front of the rollout of the, of the consumer directed program in hopes that this would be helping them do some troubleshooting early on and building appropriate tools. And so that was the outcome of these SWOT analysis that were done. Uh, as, re, as Tammy reported, um, the consumer directed respite, it was able to reach a segment of younger caregivers as it was being delivered through the area agencies on aging. So I, I claim that as a success. Um, I think our goals were as a lifespan respite coalition is to see more younger uh, caregivers um, using this resource. So I think you know it, it sets the stage for some additional marketing, communication, awareness building around all of the places that we should all be looking for, for services and supports for, for family caregivers. And with that, uh, I think we've probably used up all of our time and a bit more. Certainly want to give Daniel his due, but if there are some questions, we're happy to field those or we could take them at the end. Cassandra, your choice. Oh, well, the, I think... Uh... I already have some questions. <laughs> uh, okay, let, let's and and we're we are right on time oh, actually. So you did not use too much okay. time at all. Uh, but I wanted to ask about, um, and you may have answered this. I kind of got distracted in the in the in the middle of your presentation. So if I if you've answered this, forgive me. But when who did you test your original retrospective tool with? Or and and what sort of results have you been getting uh, from that tool? And by the way, I'm no one has to sell me on retrospective pretests. I'm uh, I've been a proponent for years and have had to fight a lot of folks on whether or not it's okay. But I like them. But anyway, can can you talk about that a little bit? So Cassandra, that's a great question. We actually modeled this tool after. Um, the tool that we had used with another ACL project. And so that tool had been used with a similar population. It was related to our dementia-friendly kind of creating awareness around 
ADRD and supports. And so we had been able to test that. Some of the lessons learned, you know, font size, really important. Um, these surveys were administered um, with, there was someone in the room while the person was taking the survey, which we also found to be really helpful as they could kind of get them started with, now, how do I use this tool? Because it does look pretty funky to be thinking about the, the question stems in the middle and responses on both ends. So we found it to be helpful to have someone there as a guide. Uh, we also tried to make some pretty clear instructions um, for the retrospective. So we did do some testing with it in a previous um, rendition of, of using this survey with similar populations. Thanks. Uh, does anyone else have questions for the Idaho team? I see Cheryl has her hand up. Oh, I think Cheryl. <laughs> Hi, um, I, well, that answered one of the questions. I was trying to think of how this was being um, conducted. Uh, you know, was it a paper form? Was it a online form? Um, you know, and, and maybe you can talk about where your decision point was on that. Uh, the other question was on just the number, uh, when you were talking about your, um, and your number of uh, uh, caregivers was 100, was that how many surveys you got? What was your ratio on um, collecting surveys? Were you a hundred percent? You know, how many of your caregivers in your in um, actually responded, and you got that data from? Um, and then I was going to ask on your fifty-four uh, year olds and younger. Now, were you getting data on the care caregiver? or the care recipient, and I was a little confused on that. So if you could talk a little bit about just your thinking around how you were gonna conduct the survey and, and then those a couple of questions there. Awesome, Sarah, do you want me to, I can go backwards <laughs> and respond um, to a point. <laughs> whatever you'd like, Tammy, go ahead. Yeah, Cheryl, uh, wonderful questions, thank you. So the, um, the 54 and younger caregiver uh, that, that was the actually the caregiver, uh, not the care recipient. So uh, we were looking specifically at, at, at that uh, age population of caregivers. Uh, and, and that information was collected uh, as the caregiver enrolled in the consumer directed respite program. Um, gosh, I'm sorry, I was gonna go backwards first and then I just kind of lost the other questions. <laughs> You know, Cheryl, um, so one of the benefits um, of running this project through the university is we do run all of our processes through the IRB, our Institutional Review Board, which really does help us get our heads together around what steps we're going to take, what precautions are we using to assure the anonymity and also the ability for a participant to decline to participate. So that's, I think, a critical step in this design is it, it does get a very thorough review from our institutional review board. Uh, it's not a 100% response rate. People did have the option of declining. And the way we set up the data collection process was, is the consumer directed respite program, the the individual facilitating it through the AAA would make a visit at the beginning of the program and then in six months. And so they were actually able to administer the survey at that six months, approximately six months check-in and ask the participant to complete the survey that was put into an envelope. It was then given to Lynn and then Lynn would get the surveys to, to us for analysis and, and data entry. Is kind of how that process went. And it was paper. Yeah, this was all paper. Are there any other questions? So again, I'm not clear. This is Nadine from Oklahoma. The percentage that that actually responded. Yeah, um, Lynn, do you have the total numbers that participated in the consumer directed respite program? I don't have that here on my. That's a really good question. I'd have to go back and look at the numbers. Um, but they're pretty high. I mean, we have actually we've had 107 responses on our surveys. Um, 
and you know how it's six months, so it's variable times throughout the process. So I think we have a really good response rate. Um, I would have to say it's probably up at least 90, 95% response rate um, and, without and, looking at the data and the numbers. And if I'm understanding you correctly, you pretty much do it with them? Absolutely, Nadine. It's very hands-on. Yes, ma'am. Right. Which helps, of course, with, uh, with the response rates. Right. We, uh, just a little twist on it, um, we're, we don't allow vouchers to go out until they answer the pre-survey. Pre <laughs> and then they get their voucher. We do get 100% that way. <laughs> um, and we don't have anybody, you know, that won't, you know, that declines or doesn't take the rest. But we've not had anybody say, well, I'm not filling that. I don't want the vouchers because I'm not going to fill out the survey. We'll walk them through it. We'll take them through it and get them there. But um, I was just curious, just because we kind of have a little different method and process, just what your response rate was. But very good. Good information. Nadine, do you then do a post-test? Yes, six months. We're so, much like you guys. Uh -huh. And again, we don't give out the next vouchers until we receive uh -huh. that. Post. Uh -huh. So it's very much deep around um we need this information to continue on so please take the time and if you have trouble we'll walk you through it we'll handhold you through this the most of them fill it out on their own yeah yeah thank you ladies great job thank you and we will have time at the end uh, of today for more questions so i before we go any further I would like to let you know that Emily Anozi, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Emily, uh, is joining us from, um, uh, she's helping Lori Stallburn from ACL. So welcome, Emily. Do you have any? I'm... Thank you very much. Thank you all. Good afternoon. There you are. <laughs> I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. Very happy to be here. Um, yes, I am a new project officer um, on the Lifestand Respite Grant, so I know all of you know about that. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, I joined in August. I'm not new to HHS, but this is my first time, you know, I'm practicing as a gerontologist. So I'm really excited and it's, I'm thrilled to learn and listen to all of you today. And I've really been enjoying these presentations and learning so much, um, you know, about the work that Arch does, you know, to, to bring all of you together. So again, I'm just here listening and taking this in. And if you need anything, um, feel free to let me know. And again, I work with Lori um, as another federal project officer on the grant. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, at this point, I'm going to introduce Daniel. Daniel, you, I'm going to let you pronounce your own last name. I, I'm going to mess it up. And he's with the University of Montana, and he's going to be talking about the WHO 5. Uh, Daniel, I will, um, I'm going to share my screen. And it, you, this is going to be a little bit funky, everybody, because the only way I've been able to um, to make my this work is if I uh, if I go here <laughs> to Daniel. There you are, and um, and so I can click, and I'll let you tell me when you want me to open the Who Five, but I'll let you go okay. ahead and take it away, Daniel. Thanks, Cassandra. Um, First off, I have to say I'm from Montana State University, Cassandra, and that's okay. You know, the University of Montana is my arch rival, the Grizz, you know, we're the Cats, um, and we beat them in football this year, so we're, we're proud of that. Um, but yeah, as Cassandra said, I'm, I'm an assistant professor at Montana State University and part of MSU Extension, so not only do I do my teaching role, I also work in the community with my Extension agents as partners throughout the state, the entire state. Um, uh, part of what I do, I am the director of the Montana Kinship Navigator Program. Uh, we're in the midst of that big study to uh, incorporate case management into what we do. Um, I'm also the founder and developer and director of the Montana uh, Caregiver Respite Retreat Program, which I'm gonna talk to you about today and why I use the WHO5 in that for assessment. Uh, that program was developed in March of, well, it was over COVID and then implemented or began the process of implementation in March of 2022. And that program primarily focuses on bringing caregivers 
uh, for a day of respite in their communities. I go out and I partner with my agents and we contact unpaid uh, caregivers across the lifespan um, as part of uh, the funding that I do receive from our uh, Montana Lifespan Respite uh, Coalition, the grant funding. Uh, with that, uh, the overall goal there is to provide uh, five to six hours of respite for these unpaid caregivers. And in the process of this, our primary goal is to make sure that they they come there not bogged down by the research that we are conducting at the, at the same time. Uh, so I, while I was developing the program, I decided I wanted to find a tool to measure well-being as an, in, an indicator of whether or not we're being successful as a, a research or an evidence-informed uh, program. Uh, so with that being said, you know, I did identify uh, with some of the counseling co colleagues that I have here in my department, uh, the WHO 5, there's also the WHO 10, and I want to say there's, I, I, haven't, I haven't looked it up lately, but I think, Cassandra, do you, was it a WHO 57? There, there's 57 questions. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, there, there's several different indexes to measure well-being, and the primary reason why I selected this one the WHO 5 was, is as I mentioned, we want to bring caregivers in and we don't want to burden them with the research we're conducting, but we want to collect that valuable data uh, on them. So if, Cassandra, if you don't mind popping up that screen. Okay, I'm going to open it. And yes, I, I was on mute, but there are a number of different WHOs out mm -hmm. there. So uh, there you go. And if you want to go ahead and expand that and then just go down and you can go to where we see the overview and the rest of that. And this is a good place for you to kind of see exactly perfect right there is fine. Um, exactly how the uh, the WHO 5 well-being index can be utilized in research. Uh, if, if you're particularly we are concerned of, of lifespan uh, respite. Um, the, the, the beautiful thing, and, and I say that about this particular index, is it's only five questions. And they have found that it's very reliable to uh, provide indication of whether or not people are in depression. And it also can evaluate and measure overall out outcomes in clinical trials. Now, while mine is not a clinical trial, but a mixed methodology of both qualitative and quantitative uh, methods of collecting data on these individuals, um, it does fit well given that uh, the overall uh, participants in generally who use the WHO5 are, uh, it's made for children. And uh, according to the guidelines here, children's age nine and above, and also older adults. Um, with that being said, you know, a majority of the participants who come into the respite retreats for us, they are generally older caregivers. Uh, we do get uh, some parents with special needs children. We also get, uh, uh, I, I say younger people, them, including myself in that 40, 50 and 60 year old age group. I don't consider myself old yet. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, we are caring for parents and we're almost in that sandwich generation. We still have children that we're, we're caring for. And so we are, we are working with caregivers across the lifespan. Um, but we do find that when we use these scale, this particular scale, that it's quick, it's not, it doesn't impede what we're trying to accomplish with the program. Uh, so we get a very uh, a quick uh, snapshot, so to speak, of the well-being of the caregivers. Um, before I get into how we use it specifically and uh, the parameters we put around it so we collect uh, sound, reliable data, um, I just want to... Uh, go into what the WHO 5 is. The WHO 5 is five questions. And if you see down by uh, below there, the scoring and the interpretation, um, the participants are asked the questions over the past two weeks, have you? And then they would answer one of uh, the six ways here. Uh, all of the time, most of the time, more than half the time, less than half, some of the time, and then at no time. And then the raw score, Right now, I'm utilizing it. I don't need the percentages yet, but I get an overall well-being score on a pretest. So we actually, before we start anything with them, we have them come in, we provide them uh, 
a, a, an envelope full of materials. They can page through it. They get to know their neighbor uh, who's sitting next to them. And then when we begin, the first thing what we do is we introduce the research uh, based on or according to our, our IRB approval process uh, um, that we have here at our university. And we have them fill out the WHO 5 questionnaire before we even begin providing them respite for the day. Um, we want to get uh, basically that raw data uh, right when they come in, while they're still kind of feeling the way they are as they, you know, as they are in a current state of well-being. Um, then from that point, um, I just wanted to scroll down just a little bit farther in terms of use. Um, it's a WHO5, and all of the WHO indexes are free of charge. It's the World Health Organization. I don't know if I've said that yet. Um, and then for further information, the WHO5 website is right there. And it's got a, I, I didn't go in there if I go in there on my screen here right now, uh, how many different languages. So it's in several different languages. It's not just for English speakers like me, which is fantastic. I, I find that it's uh, great that it's already translated and um yeah i don't remember how many it is here it's uh i'm looking i don't see it's several different languages which is yeah. great albanian <laughs> arab <laughs> bulgarian you can see the list yep uh, it's amazing and then from this screen you can actually go in and you can click on it and i provided a direct link to the english version in in the chat so you can go ahead and pull that up on your own you get a copy of it. We'll go over those five questions real quick. Uh, over the last two weeks, I have felt cheerful and in good spirits. And when I uh, provide this, this uh, index to the individuals, the, the survey, I, I emphasize over the last two weeks, how have you felt? I want a current state of well-being. And the second is, is I don't have them overthink it. I say, Give me your response as soon as you read the question. I don't want them to overthink. I want them to go with how they're feeling in the moment. Um, and then this is filled out in person. I know that was a question on the last one. Uh, we get 100% uh, response rate because they're there. They want to have that respite. They want to know what we're going to provide them for the day. So they all uh, sign up. They, they sign the, the, the informed consent. Um, that's part of the process, but it's quick. We also at that in the informed consent, we also collect their raw demographic data. Um, so we get to uh, have all of that information along with that because that's important for the end. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But so they felt cheerful and good spirits. Have I felt calm and relaxed? Uh, I have felt active and vigorous. I woke up feeling fresh and rested. My daily life has been filled with things that interest me. And as I mentioned previously, it, it provides us a raw score of how they are, uh, how they are in their well-being, and can indicate uh, areas of depression, um, maybe um, you know just overall uh, low well-being scores. And and in general, I'm going to provide you a rough number. It's not an exact number. We've had approximately 130 unpaid caregivers over the last year participate in our respite retreats, and the Average pre-score, and it's all five totals together, is 2.85 on the pretest. Oh, it's pretty low. Yeah. Um, we, have, we have a lot of people who are zero ones and twos, and then we get some people who come in and they're three fours and put maybe some fives. We've got some who are okay, um, but the overall pre is 2.85, which is really low. As they say here in uh, how to calculate, if you want the percentage, you just multiply by five. And that gets your overall percentage, which that is extremely low. Um, yeah, I, I've got to say, Daniel, I, I took it myself and I was thinking if I had a score anything under 12, I would be concerned about myself. Yep. And in fact, and, uh, if, if you are look, there cutoff scores? Yeah. So if you look on, on the well-being scale itself and the link that I provided in the in the chat, they talk about that, that. Um, it is recommended to administer the major depression I, I, ICD-10 inventory if the raw score is below 13. So that's, yep. that's an indication if you're really measuring well-being and you're, you're focused particular on mental health, you're need, you need to get them into there. And I would say I have a lot of my 
uh, unpaid caregivers, they come in very low well-being. They're just at their end. Um, so with that being said, um, th the other way that we, we want to measure the effectiveness, that's what we're measuring for this program, the effectiveness of the sustainable well-being practices and activities that we provide in education and experience at the respite retreat, we also provide a post-test at the end of the day. And while I'm not using the exact index, I have modified it just slightly. And I'm gonna pull it up here. Of course, I grabbed my post-test or my folder that didn't have one in. Hold on one second, I'm gonna grab one. As you can see, I'm in that soup. <laughs> I got it all right here. Um, the post assessment, I reworked the questions a little bit. Not that we're going to use that particular data, but we want a true indication of right now, right at the end of the retreat, how did we do? And instead of over the past two weeks, we have how do you feel right now? I feel more cheerful and, and in good spirits. The next one, I feel more calm and relaxed. Um, I can feel more active and vigorous moving forward. I feel more fresh and re rested. And then the last one, I'm interested in continuing to use the tools activities I learned today. They, 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 they align almost directly with the WHO5 and those raw scores that we've been averaging over this past year, the post results are phenomenal, 4.81, meaning, they get that immediate shot in the arm, we, we, we say, from the program and the different activities that we do with them. Um, so we, we, we don't stop there, though. Um, with this particular program, we're using the WHO5 at one month, three months, and then we're going to be testing at one, uh, 12 months. And along with that, how we do that is, is we place phone calls. We we uh, let the participants know that we are going to be following up, that we care about their well-being, and that please pick up the phone <laughs> when we try, or at least when we leave a message and then reply. And right now we're getting about a 35% response rate on the follow-ups. Um, we haven't dug too deep into the data because we just ended up with our last retreat for this year uh, about a week ago. So now my team, we're going to pour through that over January, February, and March, and we're gonna really dive into the data. But at one month, I can just give you this raw data score. Uh, it only decreased to about 4.23% or 4.23, I'm sorry, on the scale, the, the, five, the, the five point scale. And then at three months, we're right at about 3.89. So it's starting to dip. You're starting to see the farther away they get from that day of respite and um, while they've incorporated the activities that we, we, we train them in and how to provide themselves uh, self-care, um, it is starting to decrease, which, you know, I mean, we kind of expected. We're actually ecstatic that it's still elevated over that 2.85. And then we're just, we won't hit um, our first one-year check until March. So we're, we're working a couple of years in on that. Um, there are multiple things that you can do with this data. Obviously, with the demographic data, we can we can run uh, tests. We can run those variables uh, that we have on the different uh, questions, and then the the different demographic uh, variables that we have, and and we can compare and contrast groups. We can compare and contrast the different locations we were in, different parts of the state, and then we're able to kind of get an idea of the the levels of, of well-being of caregivers across the state. That was quick. <laughs> that uh, that was so useful. I, I, thank you so much. I'm wondering, do others have questions? Boy, you did you did you done good, Daniel. I don't hear any questions, but and I can't. Uh, I'm looking at my screen here. I don't see if anyone has a hand raised please feel free to just take yourself off mute if you have any comments, questions. Um, this is I, Cheryl. Um, Daniel, did you, how, your five that you used mm -hmm. um, and 
just t tell me a little bit about the background of where those five questions came from. The five, that's the WHO Five well, Wellbeing Index. So what's the background on how the, that tool was developed? Um, you know, I, I know the World Health Organization have primarily used it with, with children to measure their well-being um, in schools, I believe it is. That, that is about the limited background that I have on it. Um, it's, it's used internationally primarily. Um, and then I know that uh, in our counseling programs, they use that as well. <clears throat> Yeah, there is an awful lot of uh, psychometric data on the WHO5. Uh, when you uh, follow the link, and the link will be in the slides, which will be available to everyone as well. And I know, Daniel, you put a link in the chat box as well. That was uh, direct for, yeah. yeah the, there is a lot of information on the WHO5 and how it was developed, and the WHO10 and the WHO, however many because there are a number of them. But that's uh, really interesting to watch the change over time uh, coming in at being sounding clinically depressed from the numbers and then um, an immediate spike and then a slow decline. Right. And then when, when we are collecting uh, the the retest at one month, three months, and 12 months, that's the first thing we do once we get a hold of them before we talk to them about what's going on. Because once again, we use the same questions from the pretest um, over the past two weeks. How have you felt? Um, we want that indication of their current well being in the moment before we even get vol involved in asking qualitative questions. Okay. Daniel, this is Nadine from Oklahoma again. Um, question on the time frame being the one three and 12 months mm -hmm. um so you're seeing a decline right at three months already and then a drastic decline at 12 months is that kind of what i'm oh, hearing you say no, we, we haven't we haven't reached the 12 months uh oh gotcha, uh, gotcha so we we i'm i'm we're anticipating that there is um we just see that um so Part, part of the reason why we're testing one month, three months is, is because we're an extension. Our programs, we want to know how long they're effective for. And then uh, for this particular program, we're anticipating that at six months, we're going to need to go back in and, yeah. and do another respite retreat. You know, and Well, then and, and that was my concern. If you didn't do a follow-up retreat and you're going from three months to 12 months, how do you know? Maybe three months they're they're still doing pretty good, but how do you know from three months to twelve months where the real different maker, right. where the game changer is? Right. I'm just curious, but right. Gen generally, with our programs, we want to run them every six months. Um, that's the goal, so that's why we're just gonna, you know, I, I guess we probably should go in there at six and nine months as well. We should test that, and that might be a modification that we have to do to the research next year yeah. going yeah. forward. Just in the beginning, I think, just to feel get a feel where that game changer is, you know, right. where that where the majority now everybody's going to, you know, tank possibly differently, but yep. um, it'd be just interesting to see how that all work shakes out at what month is the yep. majority. Yeah, and that's why we're pouring through the data, uh, January, February, March. Uh, yeah, January, February, March, and then end of March we're starting up respite retreats. We've already developed our second. Uh, educational round of modules. Uh, they're all new, so we can invite previous attendees and new attendees to come to the next ones. And then we're continually cycle through, um, yeah. you know, existing locations and new locations. Great program. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, the, the other thing is, I, I imagine you're collecting data on other services families are receiving, because if you're you know, they may be getting other respite or other resources, or maybe they just won the lottery. And so, <laughs> yeah, they're feeling better. So there's so many different um, variables that contribute to your feelings of well-being. That right. And and the one thing that we do is, is at the end of our, our respite program is, is we, we, you know, obviously advertise Montana's uh, respite voucher program as well. The, the, you know, they can move, you know, even though they participated in, in my program, that there's that benefit of, of our voucher program, uh, our AAAs in all the areas, we advertise that. And then we also 
Um, on our campus, we have a, a counseling center, you know, that's a sliding fee scale. It starts at $3 for counseling sessions on up. And we, you know, we provide those referral services for that. And it, it you know, it depends if they're using those. Now we check in and we collect whatever qualitative data that we can, you know, gather at that point, at those time points. Um, you know, but primarily we're, we're measuring the effectiveness of this program. You know, we're collecting all sorts of data, but it, you know, it's very specific and very focused on what we're, we're doing on this one. Thank you. Um, and we'll have more time at the end of, and, and any other questions for Daniel before we move on? I see Sarah has one. What is Sarah, the Please go we're... off mute and ask away, Sarah. I, I see it Daniel, here. It, it would be helpful, um, and and you can send information about this as well, or put it in the chat. But just in terms of what are the self care tools that come that the individual walks away from from the retreats? Are there some specific right. strategies, methods, interventions that you're weaving into so, the? Retreats? So I develop I developed uh, created the sustainable self care curriculum, and that's what I'm using. It's. Uh, it's based on uh, research um, on the impacts of social, and then I use the framework of Kolb's experiential learning cycle. Uh, so we provide an experience. We then uh, do that activity. We incorporate tools of how I can incorporate five minutes of, of sustainable or self-care practices for myself. It's usually breathing. Uh, stepping back from their circumstances. And then we use the, we use four different activities that we have in there. Um, I'd be happy to share my curriculum with anybody um, who's interested to take a look at it. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we're, we're testing the effectiveness of this curriculum on the individuals. Um, part of the, the data that, that we're going to be going into next, the next line of research is, is testing those individual variables, the different curriculum uh, that we've created. Um, these are groups. We, we bring in as many as 25 caregivers into a group um, in the local community. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We're, we're going to move on right now, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end because there may be more questions. Um, I was asked, and I want to thank you, Corey, in Nevada. Uh, if you're there, when I and a few other people when we were at the Lifespan Respite uh, grantees meeting, someone said, how do we find out if we have statistical significance? Is there a way of doing this? And Corey, if you want to pipe in, you're welcome to. Um, is there a way we can do this? Because we don't have a big budget for hiring external evaluators. And I said, well, actually, in, it's very easy. Uh, for the most part to, to measure that. But I thought what we do today is talk about, and I'm gonna hope that I'll be able to share. So play from start, oh no, no, play from current slide. I'm gonna see, I'm, I'm wondering, can someone tell me if you are seeing uh, my actual slide or are you seeing my um, notes? Can you can you hit play from the start? I didn't I didn't hit play. I wanted to go right to this or slide. Play from right current here. slide, whatever. Yeah, the current slide. What statistics about my data? Can you see my um no? I just can you uh, just tell me, Jill, do you see my notes page or do you see my slide? We see your slides, but it's in it's not in slide mode. Oh, okay. it's got full well, screen. Okay, well then let me see. Sorry about this. I'm going, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing and I'm just going to share my, um, uh, I think I have to share my desktop. I apologize. Um, Sandra, you're in good company. We've all we've all been here. Yeah, and and you know what? That's why I'm glad I'm with the Arch Group because we're all friends. I hope, and if not, you'll have to forgive me. But I just want to um, I'm going to share my desktop, 
And that way you should be able to see my slideshow. And, um, and I just wanted to talk about, so hopefully what you're now seeing is my screen and it's not in a slideshow, but just tell me quickly, uh, Jill or someone, are you seeing my slide? It should say what statistics about my data are important. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Okay. <laughs> this is what we're going to do. So I, I just wanted to give you a quick, if you don't have an external evaluator, it's just your program. Uh, th there's some things that it's really important for you to have at your fingertips, I think. And simple, straightforward, the in. How many people responded? If you did a survey, a pre-post survey, you need to have that number. And then if you're doing uh, like a like art scale, you, you want to have the mathematical average. So the mean, what, what are the average scores that you got? And then another important number I think is the middle value. So half of the values were the median, half of the values were larger and half of the values were smaller than this number. And another number I think it's really important to know is your standard deviation. And that is, and by the way, all of this can be calculated very simply in a simple Excel spreadsheet. So before we get to statistical significance, and I'm gonna show you how to calculate that and talk about what it means, I would say these numbers are probably the most important numbers you would need to have. Um, the, um, I'm going to see if I can uh, share view just set from the current slide. I'm just hoping you guys are going to be able to see, uh, see this. So um, this is a, 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 an example, a picture of an Excel spreadsheet. And as you can see, I have, um, a list of three tools and I have or three questions and I have the pre-test score and the post-test score for each of those. And so what I wanna know is the in, just the number of people who responded. And then I want an average. What were the average, the mathematical average of those responses? And then the standard deviation, and that is, what is the average spread? How close were those scores from the mean? How close did each score fall away from the mathematical average? And if anyone, uh, I can show you how to do this in Excel. Right now, I'm just going to talk about it, give you some examples. I am happy to walk through individually with anyone who wants to phone me and go on a Zoom meeting, I can show you with your own data and Excel how you can get these numbers quick and dirty very easily. So the stand, I'll show you the standard deviation. The other thing is the median. So uh, how many of the numbers were above or below the mean? So why is a standard deviation important? It's so we know how representative that average really was. 68% of all scores are going to fall within one standard deviation of the average. So if you have a really low standard deviation, it means the scores tend to be grouped right in the right at the average. A high standard deviation means that they're spread over a large range. Now, here's what it looks like. So here we have an average of four. I have a tool and we ask, do you strongly disagree, mostly disagree, slightly, all the way up to strongly agree? So we have seven points here. And lo and behold, that average number looks about right. The average is four, and sure enough, most of them are close to four. The standard deviation is 1.2. So most of the scores are grouped around that average. 
But here's another thing. We have the same average. And yet only one of the scores was actually a four. So you have a high standard deviation here. So that average really doesn't represent most of the scores at all. So that's why you want to have a standard deviation. If you have a really high standard deviation, I would want to look at my data and sort it in different ways. And here's a good reason for hiring an external evaluator to really help you understand what's going on with your scores. And you might want to sort your data in lots of different ways. Um, now, those things that I think are really important, the mathematical average, the number, the standard deviation, really important. And folks will say, well, are your scores, I have a pretest score of, let's say it's the who, and the pretest score is 2.1 out of a possible 25. Uh, and the post test is a 3.4. Is that statistically significant? Well, what it means is we have two scores and the example is 5.13 to 5.56. Would I get those scores just accidentally as a matter of chance? If I threw the dice a uh, hundred times, am I going to get, will, would I still get those answers? So is that difference between those two scores an accident? Generally, statistical significance just tells us if the difference in two sets of scores is due to chance or not. Significant differences are most likely to be real. And generally, two sets of scores are considered statistically significant if there's less than a 5% probability that the differences were due to chance. Now, how do you figure this out? Well, a t-test uh, can reveal, and there are a lot, there are a lot of different types of tests, but we're just going to talk about a simple t-test can tell you whether or not two sets of numbers are statistically different, and it will result in a p-value. So a difference is significant. That means it probably didn't happen by chance when the p-value is less than 5%. The lower the p-value, the more significant the difference. And I want to show you an example. And this is, again, where it might get a little bit funky. Oh, I, I'm hoping that everyone can see in front of them a, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and what I did is I actually put in some fake data here from the WHO. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for introducing me to it. So I put in a lot of fake, fake pre-post data for each of the um, items in the WHO 5. And I came up with scores. And I have total pre-test scores and total post-test scores. And again, if anyone wants to call me afterwards and I can help you set up tables like this in Excel so you can calculate them, I'm glad to do that. But in these two columns, M and N, I have all of the average, the, the mathematical means of the pretest and the post-test scores. And then what I can do using Excel is I can enter uh, a formula for a t-test. And so what I did is I, in this formula bar, I put in t-test, and then it's going to ask me for the first array. I want to look at the, all of the pretest averages. So I'm going to choose M2, because the first the first uh, response average is in M2. And then I have actually 50 sets of data here. So it goes to M51. That's my first set of data. So I'm comparing the pretest. And I want to compare it to the post test, which is 
N2 through N51. And then it's going to ask me what, uh, what kind of, uh, how many tails. Just trust me, we're doing a two-tailed pretest. Um, so I'm going to put in two. And then it's going to ask me for whether it's a paired or not. And this is a paired pretest, or sorry, paired pre-post test. So I'm enter and I get this strange number and I think, what does that mean? I've got to turn it into a real number. And as you can see, it's 0 .000. Uh, clearly this is less than, it's a smaller, the P value, oh my goodness, there you go. It's way less than 0 0.05. So this is considered statistically significant. So when I ran the t-test with Excel, I come up with uh, serious, uh, it's seriously statistically significant. And I want you to, to hold that thought for a while. I'm gonna show you another way of doing this using an online calculator. There are two different ones that you can use if you don't wanna use Excel. The first one I'm going to show you, well, I'm only gonna show you one actually, and this is GraphPad. Okay, and what I can do here is I can take, just cut and paste. I'm going to paste up to 2000 rows. So the group one, I'm going to copy, I'm going to my Excel. I'm going to copy all those numbers, the pretest scores. So I just copied those. I'm going to put them in here. I'm going to copy the post test scores. And I'm going to paste them in. And now I'm going to calculate these. And I get a result. Ooh, I, I, I messed up, you guys. I, I did an unpaired t-test. I've got to go back and, and do this again. Um, I forgot to choose paired t-test. I apologize, but I've got the same numbers. Calculate now. And as you can see, it says the p-value is less than 0 0.001. By conventional criteria, it's considered to be extremely statistically significant. And it also has the mean, the standard deviation. And you'll notice that those means and standard deviations are exactly what Excel calculated for me as well. So those are ways that you can find out whether or not your results were statistically significant. Now, I, and again, I've just showed you this really quickly. Uh, I am really happy to work with anyone who wants me uh, to, to help you with your data. If you can get it in Excel, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, but, okay, save, I gotta get out of here. But you may still want to get professional evaluation help. And it's not, people say, well, is it statistically significant? I hear this all the time, people asking that question. And just because something is statistically significant, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is clinically significant or it makes a real difference. And um, I could go on the WHO scale, the WHO 5, I can go from a 2.8 to a 2.9. And if we have enough numbers, we could, that will turn out to be, it could be statistically significant. It wasn't an accident. But if my improvement, it may have gone up a little bit, but it doesn't necessarily mean 
that everyone is, you know, functioning really well. Um, a 10% improvement in symptoms of depression may be statistically significant, but the individuals may still be clinically depressed. Uh, going from drinking 24 beers a day to drinking 20 beers a day may be statistically significant, but it doesn't mean that you don't have a, a problem with drinking. So finding out whether your sets of numbers are significant, that's important. I think you should do it. You should know whether your scores were not just a result of chance. On the other hand, there are other things you want to look at, and this is where getting evaluation help can really be useful. Um, looking at different things that may have contributed to the changes in your pre and post test scores. I mean, that's really important. Um, de deciding as uh, based on normative data uh, on, for example, the WHO, whether or not the scores that you're seeing are uh, suggestive of depression. You know, looking at, at, you know, looking at your data from lots of different angles is really, really helpful. So I just wanted to bring that up um, before we go any farther. So I, I hope, Corey, did that help you at all? I, I know, Corey, you were the one who uh, came up and uh, I'm gonna stop sharing and ask me to do that. And now I've got to get back into the group. So, okay, I, I think we're back now. Corey, did that answer any of your questions about statistical significance? Yes, and it answered much more than my tiny brain can accomplish <laughs> and hold in, but yes, it did. <laughs> okay. And you know, you are completely welcome. I, I really, and I issue this uh, invitation to anybody uh, if you want to see how Excel does so much. And all you have to do, if you can enter your data into an Excel spreadsheet, there's um, an amazing amount of uh, work that it can do for you to help you. Is there, are there any other questions about this? And I got through that in 13 minutes, so I feel pretty pleased. Any more questions about the value of statistical significance or how to how to um, find it? I see a Daniel, exactly. We ask questions to ask why and what is occurring. Yeah, we want to know why they still have improved well-being. Are they using the tools we provided exactly? So you see numbers going up or down. What is influencing that? Okay, great. So, you know, we're, we've got uh, 15 minutes left, I, and I do not hold people hostage to a clock, but what I would like to do is talk uh, to people about future topics that they would like, and feel free to go off mute or put it in chat. Um, are there any other subjects, uh, conversations you'd like to have in future uh, meetings? I'd love to hear from you. So now is your chance. And everyone's on mute, so. So I guess not. Uh, but I, I really want to thank so much the team from Idaho and from Montana uh, so much for joining us today. Uh, also, Jill, thank you, um, and Emily from ACF. I look forward to chatting with you in future. Um, unless you have any closing remarks, Jill, I'm going to sign off. I did want to just uh, let everyone know because we're so proud and excited about these, and they have really not a lot to do with performance measurement directly, but indirectly. We just released three podcasts that Cassandra and Susan did uh, called Conversations on Caregiving, Exploring Respite Care Innovations. And so if you have time over the holidays, uh, while you're going for a walk or taking a break, um, you can listen to these podcasts on the ARCH website, on Spotify, on iTunes, 
whatever device uh, is your preferred way to listen to podcasts, please take a listen. They're all focused on our innovative and exemplary respite services, specifically uh, volunteer um, efforts that uh, use students, uh, university students for respite volunteers, but they're really some wonderful, um, inspiring and informative uh, podcasts. So uh, I'll put the link uh, to it right now into the uh, chat. But we also, I said it around earlier as well. But I want to wish everybody a very, very happy holiday season, a uh, happy, healthy, safe, uh, and a wonderful new year. And uh, we'll see all of you in the in 2023. And thank you, Cassandra, for really putting this great, great uh, presentation together. Again, again, thanks to Idaho and Montana folks for sharing all that great information. Right. Thanks again, everyone. Happy holidays.